and welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. This is a review for Hairdo and joining me today is my friend who does a lot with his hair apparently, is my good friend Blue Genocide. Say hi. That couldn't be any further from the truth, but hi everybody. <laughs> yes, well, in any case, so this is uh, Hairdo. It was released on the 15th of January 1949. It's the 545th in a series and it's directed by Frizz Freeling. And you can currently find this on the Looney Tunes Gone Collection Volume 3 DVD set and I believe it's on HBO Max as well in HD. This is under copyright, so uh, in case you haven't seen this cartoon, it's pretty straightforward. Elmer is after a rabbit with his wabbit twacker. And the two end up at a grand old theatre where Bugs continues to mess with Elmer. So, pretty straightforward there. So, to start things off, we'll just go through a bit of uh, trivia here. Because there's actually quite a bit in, in this uh, cartoon, which you know, I actually hadn't seen for a while. And we'll be discussing the terrible title very shortly too, which I'm sure you're eager to do there, Blue, I, I would imagine. I, I find that the Frizz cartoons have the worst titles. The, yeah. The Bugs Frizz cartoon, yeah. Exactly unless, right. Unless they, unless they have Yosemite Sam involved, then they usually are pretty named pretty well, like Bugs Bunny Rides Again and stuff like that. Yeah. But these are, but otherwise, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. This one could have been named better. But in any case, as is typical with a lot of Frizz cartoons, especially after his layout man, uh, Hawley Pratt, joined the crew, you're going to see a lot of references to Frizz, to Hawley, and a few other various members of his crew, and even other members. So you'll see a, a billboard of, uh, referencing Frizz himself. You'll see a sign saying Hadley and Pert, which appears to be a reference to Holy Pratt, some sort of a weird mix-up of his name there. And you'll see a film poster called uh, Backwash, which <laughs> is a great title there, I've got to say, starring Pete Burness, and Pete Burness was an animator. You'll see Dick's Malt Shop, which I'm, I'm just guessing here, it appears to be a reference to Dick Bickenback, but... I could be wrong. So if you know of another dick that was working around that time, and I'm sure there were plenty of dicks around. Da -da -tss. Good night, uh, everybody. <laughs> good night, everybody. Um, let me know in the comments below. Champs looks like a reference to Ken Champin. And this I'm proud of, because I only noticed this on the HD copy, but there is a very, very, very tiny reference to Virgil Ross, as in Virgil Ross Occultist. And I, I was actually surprised I saw it. I, I actually missed it every time I've seen it, so... There we go. Oh, and there is a um, reference to Shapiro's, but I'm not sure who that is. And if you know who it is, definitely let me know, because I'd like to know. So there we are. All right. So and you, probably, you guys are probably wondering, is that movie Anthony Adverse real? It is indeed real. It's a film from 1936. However, looking at the film synopsis, in 18th century Italy, an orphan's debt to the man who raised him threatens to separate him forever from the woman he loves. I mean, I'm just reading IMDb there because I haven't seen the um, film, but... Yeah, ne <laughs> neither have I, but just going off the Wikipedia page for it, I find that it's really interesting that apparently, even though it, it's very controversial based on its rating, because it has a very low rating on IMDb, apparently, at least according to the Wikipedia page. And it seems to be very hit and miss with people. But the other interesting thing I found out about it, just by going on the Wikipedia page, is that it's directed by a guy named Mervyn Leroy. Leroy? I don't know if that's how you say it. It looks like it's French. But anyways, it says here that in 1933, he did a movie called Elmer the Great. Oh, wow. I, know. I just thought that was kind of a weird coincidence. So I wanted yeah. to bring that up. <laughs> of course. But from what, what we can gather, though, I mean, why this film was chose to be showcased in this short, aside from the fact that it is a Warner Brothers film, albeit one from 13 years ago at th this point in time, well... See, I was here looking to see if it maybe got a re-release recently, but at the... But you know what? They were working at Warner Brothers. Maybe they, were, they just watched it recently and it was in their heads. Yeah, that's all I can think of. But it, it, again, guys, in comments... If there is a different reason you think, let us know, De definitely. A few more bits of trivia, because this one's pr pretty interesting. Now, you see a vending machine that's similar to a cigarette vending machine in, in the cartoon, where Bugs, um, of course, gets his carrots. But you'll, you'll notice that two coins are, are taped to the carrots, and 
Part of that is due to the fact that when people would buy cigarettes through the vending machine, they would put in an amount, but the coins that are pasted on the actual, or taped rather, on the cigarette packet would be the change because vending machines weren't exactly as complex as they are today. I mean, these days I'll just tap my uh, you know, debit card on the machine and, you know, lo and behold, there's my product. But back then, you know, that to be a bit creative when it came to change. So, so there we are. The 15th balcony gag. See, this may not make too much sense for a lot of people today because, you know, cinemas today, they're, they're very standard unless you're talking about IMAX or Dolby Vision or whatever. But back then, a lot of the cinemas were grand movie houses. And if you have an opportunity to go to a grand movie house, definitely do so. I mean, I got there is one here in Melbourne I, I do go to frequently and it's amazing. They're not quite as big, but some of them were really big. Now, okay, the 15th balcony is an exaggeration here, but some of these were so big that if, if you sat in the very front, it, the screen would just be almost impossible to watch. And if you sat all the way in the back, the screen would just be incredibly small. So that, that's what the, that game's playing on. And it turns out later on when you hear the usher, which we'll talk about in a sec, <laughs> he says, <laughs> he says, masher. All right, you masher, out you go. Well, that's an old way of saying male, male troublemaker. So I think we need to bring that into the vernacular. What, what do you think? I don't know. Do you really want to be called a masher every day? <laughs> well, uh, not me, but I know you, you oh. probably call me a masher, but you know. <laughs> masher, masher. See, I, I, I always thought that masher was like another word for, um, well, pervert. Because usually you hear it, you hear it from a woman yelling it as a ma you masher. You know, like that's yeah. that's how it's usually portrayed in media. So I always just assumed it was just another word for that. Yeah, but you know, apparently not. <sighs> No, nah, oh well, we'll learn, we'll learn something new. And lastly, look, parts of this short would end up being reused in a future short, which we I will indeed be covering, called Is This a Life? Which I believe is, I haven't seen it for a while, but I think it's a cheetah cartoon. So that's a lot of the trivia for this one, because some, some cartoons have a lot of trivia, and some have a little bit, and this one, of course, had a lot. But let's discuss the cartoon itself. I mean, first of all, we've already touched on it, but yeah, terrible title. Oh, terrible. It should have been something else, um, yeah. because I love this cartoon, but I forget what it is forget what it's called every time it's ridiculous you know it's a pun to be sure but yeah well yeah i mean to be fair like we said before these were made to like entertain like a very specific audience during like a specific amount of time that it was supposed to go back to the studio and you know just sit around for a couple until they could re-release it which i think by 1949 they were starting to do the blue ribbons i believe around yeah, this the point yeah, they were. Yeah. So, you know, you probably wouldn't see the same cartoon for another at least four years unless you were looking for it actively. Exactly so. right. Exactly. But for us uh, in the future, where they obviously it's didn't expect us to do it, it's an absolute pain. But whatever. But look, terrible title aside, this is a wonderful cartoon. It's, it's really funny. It's Frizz at, uh, among his best. And you were saying to me before we recorded that this is one of your favorite Frizz cartoons of this oh, period. It really is. I mean... I find that Frizz in this period did really good with Elmer because his interpretation of Elmer, even though he said he hated using Elmer, that's interesting to me because he's a lot stronger of a character and is a foil to Bugs in the Frizz of this era's uh, Bugs cartoons because there's points where Bugs is genuinely shocked by Elmer outsmarting him. And it's kind of a little bit more of a back and forth. Yeah, for sure. Cause, cause, like, cause I, lo I love... I love the little gag there where he asks the lady to take her hat off. Well, now maybe I can settle down and enjoy this picture in peace. Uh, pardon me, madam, but may I trouble you to remove your chapeau? <gasps> you! Where did he get that hat from? Oh, Just to do hat. that. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> yeah. hat. Beautiful hat. But I, I was also thinking, had Frizz used instead of me Sam, the whole cartoon would have been different. It would have been just a yeah. completely different dynamic, I think, in the end. So, yeah, as you said, he may not have enjoyed using Elmer too much, but when he did, he typically did a good thing, which, is, which I think is great. I want to go through some of our favorite bits of this cartoon. I mean, first of all, I love how his rabbit detector is literally written as wabbit detector. And it's like, did he write that? Or is that what the product, product is actually called? <laughs> It's so funny. Well, you said that you got it from uh, Military Surplus, I think, which was apparently 
a very popular company back then, at least what I was reading. But um, it's not very good because, you know, it's labeled rabbit detector, but it's detecting everything. Oh, for sure, for sure. And of course, why is there rabbit pricing at the cinema? Like, <laughs> seems a bit... Uh... A bit bizarre. Rabbits have it good because they're getting their prices a lot cheaper than we are. Yeah, exactly right. You know, but one little interesting detail I I noticed I mean, in watching this, you know, it just shows how much of uh, Bugs loves the ladies. I did realize this a lot is how the second time he goes to the crowd, he actually goes under the legs of the two ladies. Like I thought, that's a bit cheeky of <laughs> of Freeling to put that in there. Or maybe, or maybe Pratt. Brandon Priest is like, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll just keep it in there. But you see, a bit, a bit, a bit a on the cheeky side. <laughs> if, if, if this was a clamp cartoon, you know that there'd be a weird cut there because he would have like stopped bugs in that section right there to make a stupid joke and then continue it. And that would have been cut because the censors would have caught it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> For sure. And I like the overdone maths on the vending machine. I mean, these days you can pretty much just tap a you know credit or debit card or Apple Pay or whatever you got. And uh, and it just does automatically. But here it actually breaks out every possible combination. It's like, it's like why? Now, I, I noticed you're talking a lot about the vending machine. Are you um, just maybe a little hungry or snacky? <laughs> no, I want to go back to Japan where there's a vending machine literally on just about every block. So yeah, that, that, that could be it. One thing I, especially in going to the cinemas recently, I mean, yes, in, in COVID times, you know, we're not doing it as often, but there are actual helpful ushers, you know, because, you know, like, you know, boys and girls, once upon a time in, th in theaters, they were actually ushers that were helpful. They'll help you go to your seat, like similar to you going to a play or something along those lines these days. But, they, but nowadays, you just go to the cinema and you, and you could really luck out with idiots in the cinema and, you know, you try and get someone to help you and they pretty much just say, oh, we'll just give you a refund, you know? <laughs> but I thought that was a interesting yeah. touch there. But anything you've noticed in this cartoon that you wanted to point out? Well, I kind of noticed that, you know, this cartoon, I, and I mean this in the nicest way, it's going to sound very negative, but this cartoon reuses a lot of animation from itself and what i mean by that is that there's a lot of gags where the entire gag is repeating an action where such as there's a, there's a lot of scenes where bugs is crawling across a crowded um line of seats in the theater there's the gag where he's turning on and off the intermission sign and yeah there's a lot of little uses of saving time for the production like i figure that maybe frizz Mick did that to sort of get this cartoon done in a quicker way so that he could focus on another one of his cartoons elsewhere. But that's not a bad thing. I think it's really well done in this cartoon. Yeah, I think it's just uh, Frizz, by this point, is basically a master director. He knew what he was doing and he knew how to get things done. And I don't think it can oh, too much. An another good example is when, he, when Elmer gets thrown out of the theater. I think that happens twice in this cartoon and both yeah. times it's the same piece of animation and it's really funny this is a great way to reuse animation in the cartoon and do it funny like it's a really well done way to do it exactly exactly right i mean my favorite gag has to be and this is shown a lot in a few of documentaries i've seen about Bugs bunny and it's of course the pie gag message for Mr. Fudd. Just the timing. It's got some of the best timing <laughs> yeah. for that pie to go on Elmer's face. I mean, wow. I mean, that, that's that got to be the, 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 the standout from this cartoon. I really do. You won't see this part on TV for obvious reasons, but when, he, when Bugs first turns on the intermission sign, everybody runs out in the middle of a hallway and everybody just lights up their cigarettes. They're just big cloud. Like, yep. Gee, I'm, I'm happy I wasn't around for that. But the, the pie gag is really great. But I also really like, you know, I'll say it right now because I've said it before, but there's no continuity in these cartoons. But there is a little bit of these characters have ran into each other. So there's like a little bit of a loose continuity. And what I mean by that is Elmer's not wasting any time. When Elmer goes off that cliff and he sees Bugs and Bugs just says hello, and he's got the gun and he's already like blasting at him. So he, he, he knows, knows Bugs. That rat. Yeah, he knows him. 
What's up, Doc? While, you know, there's obviously not a continuity, they were still making sure that the average viewer was aware these two know each other and they know each other well at this point. Yeah, indeed. And um, and one last gag before we get into the, the actual rating itself. I mean, we got to love the lion gag at, at the very end. I mean, what a setup. I mean, it takes a while, but it's got such a great payoff at, at the very end. Yeah, and with, with Elmer complaining like a Karen the entire time, you definitely want to see that lion <laughs> eat him. <laughs> exactly right. It's such an amazing gag at the, at the very end. So, time for the rating. I mean, I'm giving this 9 out of 10. I really enjoyed yeah. this one. It is a solid short. One of Freeze's best of the 40s. I definitely agree with you here. I mean, what, what would you rate this one? I'd say 9 out of 10 too. I think that the only thing holding you away from the perfect rating is that I... The name, the name is part of it. It's definitely not memorable enough to make that name exactly memorable but it's definitely great maybe they could have worked in a little bit more of elmer's stage fright from the last time they did it in, in these but still a great cartoon yeah exactly right so um just to wrap it up here any final thoughts any i also i also wanted to quickly add that the guy who directed anthony adverse and elmer the great he also directed wizard of oz just noticed that. <laughs> hmm so, some random film that, that no one's ever heard yeah, of, right? No, no. Well, at the, at, in 1949, that would have been a not really well-known film, so... Yeah, another discussion for another time, I'd say. But in any case, yeah. thank you all so much for uh, watching this review. Comments always welcome, of course. And until next time, take care. Oh, boy. This ought to be good. I wish I could see it. I wonder if he made it. Yeah. Yep, he made it.